And with that, I would pass it on quickly to our next speakers. Actually, so that will be uh, Catherine Mueller from the University of Iceland and Isabel Kemmer from Eurobioimaging. Eric, please go ahead. Super. So, yes, welcome um, to the session where I'll be taking like just a few short minutes on the data stewardship service. Um, as Asta already mentioned, I'm the Fair Image Data Steward of um, Eurobioimaging, and I'm located at the Biohub in beautiful Heidelberg. At least today, it's like very sunny. Um, here on the bottom right, you can see the email on which you can um, reach us on all your fair data related questions. And maybe one of them is what is actually a data steward? And maybe you can picture it something like this. I found this beautiful image from the Turing way. Um, and actually, I, I, I tend to see myself um, now here um, as the data steward depicted in, in this picture because I keep the research train running, I would say, because um, I'm involved in making sure that the best practices um, are followed. I work on identifying gaps in the um, imaging pipelines, all with the end goal to facilitate the exchange and reuse of data. But on a more technical note, what I'm actually doing is I'm trying to make the um, user projects fair. And if you've never heard of that acronym, that stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And here on the right, you see, um, I would say, an ideal pathway of fair data. So we generate the large and information-rich data uh, at our nodes, and then most of the times that should be followed by converting these data um, into standardized and interoperable file formats and metadata formats. Um, then we aim to make also the image analysis cloud compatible. Um, in the end stage, we are aiming to store the data in some form of fair data storage, which promotes then the reusability of that data. And for all of these um, sections, the Euroboy Imaging Hub actually provides support, which I'm very happy to announce that it's free because we were able to secure money from um, EU projects that have also been talked about. And more in depth, we, we provide the, these four um, categories of services. That is first the fair data consultation for users, which you will hear about um, in a second from Katrin. But also we are providing for everyone, fair training and resources. And then on the more technical side, which Asta also already mentioned, we are involved in the development of fair um, data tools and workflows, and also develop and support repositories for image data and metadata. And let me take this opportunity first to tell you about fair training and resources, because actually we have a workshop planned in, in online workshop that is free for everyone, a guide to fair bioimage data that's going to happen in two months on the 23rd of May um, from 2 to 5 CET in the afternoon here. And you're very happy. Uh, I'm very happy that um, all of you can join. The link to um, the registration will be pasted in the chat shortly. But what um, now the um, following presentation from Katrin will be about is the fair data consultation for users. And actually she, she was the first project that I was able to take. Um, and essentially in this um, project, what I, I see myself as is the puzzle piece between the users and the archives to make it possible to bring the data that the users have generated to the specific archives. Um, and the, the users, they come to me with all of these kinds of questions. First of all, what is fair if they've never heard about it? Which repository is the right, the, the right one for my data? Which data should I then include? How do we organize that data? Which metadata do I need? And we work also um, together on the submission process. So I take all these questions from the users, work on the data sets with them. And on the other hand, I'm also actively working with the archives, discussing with them if there's a special um, 
project and we need to make special arrangements with the archives, but also in general, just working with them to make the data deposition process as smooth as possible. So that in the end, the data from the users, they get swiftly transferred into the archives and with that become fair and reusable for everyone. And um, as I said, Catherine was actually the first project and the one with which we were able to shape the data deposition process inside Eurobio Imaging that we were able to take under the BiCOVID project. And now I'm very happy to announce that because of the funding from another EU project, the Evolve project, we can keep offering this service also now on a more broad range of imaging data sets. And with that, I'm very happy to hand over to Katrin to tell you all about the project that we were carrying out together. Thank you very much, Isabel. Uh, and please, Katrin, uh, take, it, uh, take it away. I'll tell you a little bit about basically um, this was my PhD project, uh, and for my PhD, I mainly used light seed microscopy, which, as most of you know, generates like enormous amounts of data. And I was faced with this question after my PhD, like, what do I do with this data? Like, I want to publish it, but the paper requires it to be stored somewhere accessible. And um, I actually, you know, feel for my data, it was a good data set, I think. <laughs> Uh, so I really wanted to be accessible to, to other people. Um, and I started looking and, and then I found the Biomets Archive um, actually because of uh, another person from your bioimaging. And I'll tell you about this, but first I'm going to tell you a bit about my project, uh, what I actually did with the light microscope <laughs> so that you can imagine how big the data set is. And then I'll tell you a bit about the process uh, of, of actually getting my data up there to the Biomets Archive. Um, Okay, so my um, my project is also about the brain, like uh, the other two user talks <laughs> are here, surprisingly enough, uh, which I think is uh, an amazing organ. It's actually made up of millions of neurons that form trillions of connections that allow us to do everything that we do and be who we are. Um, but interestingly, the development of this complex organ is characterized by a massive production of cells but a large proportion of these, up to 70%, actually never make it to functioning neurons. So up to, yeah, 70% of them are destined to die. And one of the main reasons why this seemingly wasteful process happens uh, is to ensure the correct numbers of neurons and connections between them. Um, and, um, and they die in a process called apoptosis, at least during development they do. Um, and as a response, um, we have a specialized immune cell that are called microglia. And here you see an example of that, the microglia labeled in red and the dead neurons labeled in white or gray, um, mainly these um, donut-shaped dots here, but these are also axonal debris. Um, and these cells actually move around within the brain. Yes, that sounds creepy, but they do. And they collect all the dead cells and eat them up, basically, in a process called phagocytosis. Um, and this is basically an example of the optic tectum of a zebrafish developing brain, but it could be any neurogenic region in any brain region. And we know how incredibly important these cells are because when we remove these cells, there is a massive accumulation of dead cells in the brain. So, um, you know, how do they achieve this? How do they manage to eat all of these dead cells and not become overwhelmed? Um, this is questions that Michael in the lab is now focused on answering. Uh, and we use um, live zebrafish brains since they're transparent, like the zebrafish in general is transparent when they're, they're young. And so we just put the zebrafish under the light seed microscope and visualize what happens, which is really and we've developed several tools to visualize both the microglia and the thick cells. Um, and this technique often generates like very large amounts of data. Like I often had to post process terabytes of data as in one session. So uh, you can imagine how helpful having the BioMRT archive on my side was at the end. But now by zooming into one of these cells, um, well, here you see them collectively moving around within the brain. And when you zoom into one of these cells, you can see how it's just happily going around there, eating its donut-shaped apoptotic cells. 
And we know that when microglia are compromised, for example, in this mutant that cannot um, digest the engulfed material properly, it significantly impairs their capacity to engulf that neurons. So there must be a mechanism in place that regulates this process, the, the microglia phagocytosis. And that was the aim of my study, basically, how do microglia regulate their uptake? And what are the underlying mechanisms that facilitate microglia phagocytosis? Um, so I developed several tools in addition, but I'll just briefly tell you what my findings were. So quickly, uh, first of all, I found that I focused on, on the actual process of, of phagocytosis. And I'll show you this again, I think. Here you see uh, basically a successful phagocytic event where the microglia basically reaches out, which is uh, with, with its act. Um, dendrites and engulfs the neuron. But I also noticed that in many cases, it would kind of look like it engulfed the neuron, but then it just stopped, it forced it. And while the microglia make around 10 attempts in this case per hour, uh, almost almost half of them actually end up being aborted. So it looks like the microglia has a signal, it senses the dead neuron, it goes there, it feels but it's not enough. There's something missing still for it to actually successfully engulf it and remove the cell. Another observation that I made uh, was that um, while the microglia are surrounded by multiple apoptotic cells, like you saw in the first image, they have many branches and all in you know many directions, but they don't engulf these neurons all at the same time, but they do it really one by one. And we also found that these events can be really close in time, but that generally happens only when the two neurons are very close together. So when we quantified this, we found that there was a clear temporal spatial correlation. So the closer the two uh, neurons were together, the faster the microglia went from one to the other. And these data implicate basically two things. First of all, that uh, microglia need to polarize towards the individual targets somehow, and there are mechanisms in place that regulate the microglia engulfment rate. They just they don't just go and, and engulf and engulf and engulf. Um, and so I generate a lot of tools to look at intracellular components because I was interested to see you know how the insides of a microglia look like during this process. Um, and I still visualize this. These are still microglia in a living superficial brain, just to emphasize that. Um, and I did all of these analysis in 3D using Maris. Um, uh, automated and, and manual tracking. And when I looked at the centrosome, which usually is central in cells now, um, it's actually quite dynamic in microglia. You can see how it moves into the phagocytic branches right before the engulfments, which we thought was pretty amazing. Um, and we started looking at it, and the speed is actually, <laughs> I think it's enormous for, for a you know, an organelle in a cell to actually move up to uh, 14 micrometers per minute. Uh, and what we also noticed that is that right, you know, at the time, the, these red lines, they actually take the time of engulfment right before uh, they are engulfed. The centrosome actually moves into the phagocytic branch and towards um, the cargo away from the cell body, basically. Um, and we saw this, this is just one time lapse here, but we actually quantified this for many, many microglia and overlaid them on, you know, uh, at the time of engulfment and found that all, in almost all cases before the engulfment happens, the centrosome starts moving towards the, the event that is about to happen. Um, and that, you know, it's not because the cell soma or the cell body is moving there. It's really because the centrosome is moving there. So this is the cell soma, the, uh, the nucleus towards the neuronal distance, and this is the centrosome towards the uh, neuronal distance, you can really see that it's after the engulfment happens that the, that the soma also starts moving sometimes. So we thought this was pretty amazing, and we think this really means that the centrosome might be this time-limiting thing, right? But to test that, I uh, made an overexpression model where I overexpressed the centrosomal marker, um, and then I got many microglia in the surface brain uh, displaying two centrosomes. And when we quantified their engulfment rate, we found that these cells are actually super active. Uh, you see, both of the centrosomes are very dynamic, and their engulfment rate uh, 
yeah, is increased by 50%. And what we also found amazing was that now, occasionally, very rarely, we found two phagocytic events happening simultaneously. So we believe that this really means the centrosome is uh, rate limiting. And so why is the centrosome going all the way there? Um, we looked into other similar processes with other immune cells and found that the T cell, when the T cell actually moves and engages with its target, which in that case is about kill and eat, the centrosome also moves to the immunological synapse, as it's called. And in this case, it's really to bring all the cytolytic granules and signaling um, molecules to the synapse to facilitate the process of killing or interacting with the target. And so I made uh, reporters for early endosomes and also lysosomes and some other markers. But what I really found interesting was that the endosomes, the early endosomes labeled with RAB5, uh, which you see here, basically just the threshold for the signal and here the centrosome tracked in red. And this is the relevant video. So you can see simultaneously what is happening. So there's an event about to happen up here, uh, there, and then and all the RAP5 positive endosomes kind of follow. Um, and as a result, this uh, phagosome became RAP5 positive. So we believe this means that, you know, this is the model basically. So the centrosome movement uh, coincides with phagocytic events. Uh, it is, uh, we also found that the centrosome is the cellular mTOR, so it, it directs the microtubule organizations there. I didn't show that here, but you can find the data in my paper. Um, early endosomes move into phagocytic branches together with the centrosome, where the phagosome becomes RAP5 positive. And uh, we really believe that our data suggests the centrosome is a uh, regulating step in phagocytosis. Um, okay, so <laughs> I submitted my work to eLife, uh, which eventually became this paper, which you can find. Um, this, gen this project generated 15 terabytes of data because there was a lot of live C-properties brains that I emitted for several hours. Um, and after curation, and then I mean like cropping out only individual cells or making max projections, this resulted in 640 gigabytes, uh, which was still an enough big amount to, for me to be like, what do I do with this? <laughs> um, I, I don't really want to be carrying a hard drive around with me forever. Um, and I was leaving my lab, I was going for a postdoc elsewhere. What happens to my data now? Is it just going to be thrown down the drain? Or can somebody else even use my data, maybe? Um, in my data set, there's like, I think, 60 uh, superfish brains all imaged with the same markers, same time point. So they could be used to model something or, or test the pipeline or whatever. And also, Eli required all of the data sets to be publicly available. So how did I, how was I supposed to do that? Um, and then I found, Bioimits archive. Um, and they basically offer this missing gap in the field. They have a safe place to store my data forever and ever, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> At least with the latest funding, I assume this is the case. Um, an easy way to share my data with uh, the world, with whomever is interested, or if people just want to look around, they can see my data. Um, and it's a repository for all sorts of data sets. You should actually you have a look there's a lot of interesting stuff in there um, and what i had to do as a user i had to collect all the data sets that i used in my study this is around 640 gigabytes i can't remember how many files but a lot uh, group them and the data into different uh, study components so like my study had several different kind of aspects to test so i had to group them um, and then annotate each image with the metadata and this means i had for every study component i had a list with the names of all my images and I had to annotate every image. And the better you annotate them, the better it is for the next user or whomever wants to explore your data. Because if you if you put very minimal annotations, then people don't really know what to do with it. If you don't, yeah. So this took me around two to three weeks to curate together because it was a lot of data. Um, but for smaller data sets, that's gonna take shorter. And then um, we uploaded the data with annotations to the Biomics archive and took around two days. And then upon the paper release, that we, we released the data also. Um, and here's the accession number that you can see where everyone can basically download and explore, either explore or download my data. That's also the beauty about the Image Archive. You can actually explore it online. Um, 
yeah, so uh, with that, I want to thank, you know, everyone involved. So my, my group uh, that I was working for, the Perry Group, uh, was <laughs> really great at studying uh, to see for fish brains. Uh, the Gilmer Group, uh, Max Brambach in particular, helped me a lot with the data analysis. Microscopy facility at the University of Zurich, where I was doing my study. And then, of course, these three people who are key to this, uh, this part uh, being a success. Johanna from Eurobiome, uh, Eurobiome, she pointed this whole thing out to me and got me in contact with Isabel and Asta. And then Isabel really guided me through the whole process and helped me set everything up. So um, I have to thank them, of course, as well. And thank you all for listening. And, uh, you know, if there are any questions, I'm happy to, happy to answer. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you both uh, Catherine and Isabel for sharing your experience.